What should we remember about Christ this time of year and all through the year? Let's talk about it today on book, chapter, and verse. Welcome to book, chapter, and verse. I'm Jeff Archie. I'm delighted that you're joining me today for our study of God's Word. And each week we'll come to you to spend a little bit of time in the study of God's Word as we simply examine book, chapter, and verse. So please tune in each week as we look at God's Word together. There is nothing more refreshing than to turn to the Word of God and know His will for our lives. Now, throughout our broadcast, you'll see our contact information on the screen, and we would be honored to hear from you. And please stay tuned, for at the end of our broadcast, we will offer Bible study material absolutely free so that you may continue your studies in God's Word in the privacy of your own home. For example, we have a variety of free study aids to assist your home study, as you see there on the screen. We will have more just a little bit later. But for now, let's consider our book, chapter, and verse this week. We're going to be looking at Colossians, the second chapter, beginning with verses 16 through 23. If you'd like to follow along in your Bibles, please feel free to reach for them as we consider Colossians 2, 16 through 23. Let's read this together as we begin our book, chapter, and verse study. Again in Colossians chapter 2, beginning with verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head, from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered, and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using, after com the commandments and doctrines of men? Now to conclude, verse 23, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship, and humility, and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So as we think on these texts today in our book, chapter, and verse study, let's notice a few things. And again, if you'd like to kind of note along as we go, let's check a few things here. First of all, verse 16, let no man judge you. In other words, draw a conclusion on you because of the things that are mentioned that are shadows of things to come. Look at verse 18, to let no man beguile you, or to rob, or as the word means, make an umpire call against you, as the final say with a humanly devised doctrine. Don't let someone beguile you by the umpire call of, this is a right call in a false doctrine. Don't, don't let that happen. Notice also verses 20 through 22, to let no man be subject to the doctrines and commandments of men either. The conclusion is a will worship in verse 23. Properly divined, a will worship is a self-chosen, self-imposed, self-made worship. It's what a person sets up to satisfy them and deceiving them that they are actually pleasing God. One is quickly reminded of the desire one should have in the very next verse of Colossians 3 and verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now with this in mind, kind friends, Please consider the thought of holidays or holy days. 
You know, many questions arise this time of year concerning the birth of Jesus Christ and what we are to remember. Now, obviously, we wish to return to the Bible for a book, chapter, and verse to address this matter as well as other matters. Now, from the outset, please know that this is a two-part series. And in this broadcast, let us see what the Bible says about what we are to remember concerning Jesus Christ, N not only this time of year, but all year. Number one, let's look at another book, chapter, and verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verses 23 through 26. In this text, first of all, we remember the death of Christ through the teaching and the participation of the Lord's Supper. We look at the text of 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come." Now, as we remember the death of Christ and what we see in this text in partaking of the Lord's Supper, notice these key facts. We do so lovingly. We show the Lord's death. We show so others may see and be reminded of the death of Christ to bring one's life, if need be, into shame toward repentance. If someone thinks of his death and they're not Christians, then may it move their lives. It is to remind us of how we should live and conduct our lives. Notice the word we are to discern the Lord's body. Separate and understand what we are doing. And then we express that example to others lovingly remembering his death. Second, within this, we do so longingly. Notice, till He come. We remember His death. We long for the Lord's return, and we remember His death, so He will not forgive us, or rather forget us, for eternal life. So we do so lovingly, and we do so longingly. Lovingly and longingly, we are to partake of the Lord's Supper. And in so doing, we show and we are reminded of His death on the cross for you and for me. Obviously, when I partake of the Lord's Supper, I am not to remember His birth. I'm not to remember His resurrection. I am to remember His death upon the cross as I am commanded here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, written unto the church, the church that would come together. And Paul is actually saying what Christ taught in Matthew the 26th chapter. Partaking of the Lord's Supper, we do so upon every first day of the week as we assemble together with the pattern of Acts 20 and verses, actually verses 5 through 8, but specifically verse 7. Is the church where you attend, kind friend, are they partaking of the Lord's Supper upon the first day of every week? Someone says, well, every week they just sit upon the first day of the week. Well, upon the first day of the week they laid by in store for contribution, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. I would dare say that about every kind of denomination or church or whatever it may be called, We'll take up a weekly contribution, but when it comes to the Lord's Supper, to remember His death of something great, we would not want to do that every first day of the week. 
Let's think on those things. We remember his death through the taking and the remembering of the Lord's Supper. Let's talk about something else we should remember, not only this time of year, but all year. We remember the burial of Christ through the teaching and participation of baptism into Christ. Once again, I take you to another book, chapter, and verse of Romans chapter 6 and beginning with verse 3. In Romans 6, beginning with verse 3, Paul writes and says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now, kind friends, no question that baptism is a burial. The word itself is defined to dip, to plunge or immerse. The eunuch upon asking in Acts 8 in verse 36, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And eventually both he and Philip went down into the water to baptize him in Acts 8, 38. Listen to Colossians 2 in verse 12. Buried with him in baptism wherein also you are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised Him from the dead. Baptism is not a work to be done. Baptism is a response of one's faith and obedience to Christ. And when one is baptized into Christ, one cannot be raised to walk in a newness of life until they have been baptized into Christ and the old man of sin must be crucified and buried. Now when one is buried in the waters of baptism through one's faith, through one's repentance, and through one's confession, we are reminded of the burial of Christ and the washing away of sin in Acts twenty two sixteen, When Saul was told, Why do you tarry? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So kind friends, we remember His burial through the teaching and the application of baptism. Thirdly, we remember the resurrection of Christ through the teaching and participation of worship on the first day of the week. Once again, we return to Acts 20 and verse 7 to where we noted of the acknowledgement of remembering the Lord's Supper. In Acts 20 and verse 7, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. They were instructed and to remember of their worship unto God and the resurrected Savior in whom they lived and in whom they walked and to be an example before others. As Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb toward the first day of the week, as we note, on that first day of the week, the tomb was empty as Christ was resurrected. I love to go back and look at Matthew, the 28th chapter, and to see that beautiful account and how precious indeed it is. And yet Mary had a fear, but I love how it goes. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, to see the sepulcher. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven 
and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. Even in Mark's account of this, in Mark 16 in verse 9, just a few pages over in this wonderful book, we see written, When Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene out of whom he had cast seven devils. What a great joy to see that that tomb was empty. My wife and I have been blessed to visit what many refer to as the Holy Lands, to go back and to walk in the path wherein Christ walked. We were able to visit what is believed to be the tomb that Jesus was laid within. Its proximity is close to that of, according to what records they could come across, the burial of Joseph of Arimathea. And if you remember, he furnished the new-cut tomb for Christ. It's rather interesting to see that and to note that it's empty. And to know that the body of Christ was never found. But you know, coming off the Mount of Olives, going down into Jerusalem, close to where the walls are, right off from the Garden of Gethsemane, is a graveyard. And those tombs are still just as shut tight as they ever were. What a joy to know that the tomb of Christ is empty. Upon every first day of the week, we remember His resurrection. We teach, we instruct of the hope and the power that's in the resurrected Christ. We share the same attitude and approach of John's beautiful words while on the Isle of Patmos. In Revelation 1 and verse 10, he said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. You see, we remember the risen Savior every first day of the week as we assemble, as we've been commanded. Kind viewer, I know that many of you that watch this broadcast are unable to assemble. And I'm grateful and hope that today these few moments have prompted you to be renewed and reminded of what we are to remember. Now, as we notice carefully through the Scriptures, we do remember the suffering Savior and our Redeemer. We remember Him with all of the teaching of His death, His burial, and resurrection. According to 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and following, we remember His death through partaking of the Lord's Supper. We remember His burial when we instruct and see one baptized into Christ, baptized into His death, Romans 6, 3 through 6. And of His resurrection, when Paul proclaimed the gospel on that first day of the week in Acts 20 and verse 7, and the hope that we read of in scriptures of Mary Magdalene coming to the tomb. Now, kind friend, what I'm about to share with you is stated with all grace in light of the Word of God. But interestingly, I want you to notice something that we did not cover of which we are commanded to remember when we assemble together. Nowhere were we commanded to remember His birth through a holiday. No, my friends, that's not me being blasphemous. 
but simply looking at book, chapter, and verse on this matter. We can see book, chapter, and verse for the remembrance of His death and His burial and His resurrection. We acknowledge the greatness of His birth and His life. But yet, what are we commanded to remember as we assemble together as the church? These are things we simply want to research within book, chapter, and verse. Now, as I mentioned moments ago, this study is a first of a two-part. So, if you're unable to view our next broadcast, please make a note and please contact us here at Book, Chapter, and Verse, and we'll let you know how you can see that second part. We strive to archive our broadcast, and we'll direct you that way. We simply want to look at Book, Chapter, and Verse, and Seek out God's will for our lives. What a blessing that we remember His death, His burial, and resurrection. There are those that have died and are buried, but they're still in the tomb. The resurrected Christ is the one who makes the difference in our lives that we can take His life and apply it in ours and to look at the power of who He is. We mentioned moments ago of baptism into Christ, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. That's the gospel message according to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That is the message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And it is the message that was preached in the first century that all through the world heard it, Colossians 1:23. It is the only message of salvation God is authorized today. The beauty of hearing the gospel message is to respond and also to reenact it. When we believe that gospel message and know that Jesus is the Son of God, believing that He is, as He commanded in John 8, 24, our faith will move us to follow what God has commanded. And through Christ, he commands the beauty of repentance. Oh, except we repent, we will likewise perish, as Jesus said in Luke 13, 5. But repentance is something that a person can do to change their decision, which changes their direction. Commanded as Peter preached in Acts 2, 38 and Acts 3, 19. Even a commandment for men everywhere to repent, Acts 17, 30 and 31. You willing to change your decision? Change your direction today? Confess with the mouth as confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10, 10, to confess Jesus is the Son of God? The eunuch said in Acts 8, 38, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Actually, Acts 8, 37. And then he went into the water and was baptized into Christ. Buried with Him in baptism. The old man of sin is crucified. The body of sin might be destroyed. From now on, you don't serve sin. You're arisen in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3, 21. It's a like figure whereunto baptism doth now also save us. It's not the putting away the filth of the flesh but of the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's through the resurrection of Christ we're able to reenact the gospel message in our lives as we are dead in sin, buried with Christ in baptism, and raised to walk in a newness of life. Then as one new in life, we're like that newborn babe, according to 1 Peter 2 and verse 2. We desire the sincere milk of the Word that we may grow thereby. And then the Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews chapter 5, beginning with verse 12, that we are able then to, to go into more meat, to be stronger, to be more dedicated, and we grow. The old life is gone, the new life is before. Kind friends, would you respond to the new life in Christ? If we've shared some things today to prompt you to think, then again, let us hear from you. We'll help you with further study material as we seek together book, chapter, and verse for your life and for ours. 
Let's enjoy this hymn together as we pause from our study. May God bless you. I am a poor wayfaring stranger While traveling through this world of woe Yet there's no sickness, toil, nor danger In that bright world Friends, let us return to the Bible and remember His death, His burial, and His resurrection as He commands. More on holidays and holy days on our next broadcast of Book, Chapter, and Verse. Wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life.